Am I on? I'm on. Sweet. Uh, don't forget to ask questions, folks. There's no discussion uh, session at the end, so I'll be around in coffee afterwards and around the rest of the day. So ask questions either in the talk or afterwards, but don't be waiting for a discussion session for talks today. There's not one at the end of the day. Okay, so this is the last um, lecture in the series that Lara and I are doing. So what are we going to do in this lecture? Well, my, my plan is I wanted to show you two uh, fairly recent pieces of work to give you examples of what's going on in the field, what the type of thing people are doing. Obviously, I'm going to give you examples that we did because I know them best. Um, but I wanted to give you something kind of representative for what's going on. And I wanted to give you two kinds of examples. I wanted to give you an example of the type of general analysis that's being done. And I wanted to give you an example of the type of construction of examples, construction of solutions that's being done as well. Now, Lara was telling me that she didn't quite finish the, um, uh, the ATIA complex structure and bundle modulus being connected story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by recapping that from the beginning and finishing off that little piece of uh, physics. And then the discussion that I'll do for an example of a piece of general analysis that's been done recently will follow on from that. And what we'll do is we'll discuss moduli in the case of a Strominger system solution. Okay. Once we've done that, I'm then going to go on and give, if I have time, give my uh, second example of a recent piece of work, which is a new construction of Club yao manifolds just so you can see what kind of thing that people have been doing there. So this is a construction that I think maybe Lara didn't even mention, but certainly she didn't go into any details. So we're going to start with, uh, we want to eventually get to moduli in the Strominger system. So something that's more general than Calabiao. But we're going to start with a warm-up, which is just to finish off the type of thing that Lara was talking about at the end of her tilt yesterday. So this is a sort of a recap slash warm-up. Um, which is... goes under the name of Etia classes in the Calabiao case. So this is going to be something about Calabiao compactifications that you started yesterday and we're just going to finish it. So the way this is going to work is there's just a series of steps. And we're going to go through the series of steps in the Calabiao case, and then we'll go through exactly the same series of steps in the Strominger case. It, the algebra just gets a bit worse. Okay. So what's the series of steps going to be? Essentially, and I'm going to write them up on the board, but essentially what you do, if you want to understand the massless fields, the moduli and the compactification, there's a very well-defined prescription, which is the right way to figure out what they are. You first of all choose a background solution that you're going to compactify on. And then you perturb around this solution. So you take all the fields, and I do mean all the fields in the theory, and you perturb them around this background solution to linear order. You plug that whole mess back into the equations of motion, and any combinations of perturbations that satisfy the equations of motion will be massless fields. They'll be moduli. And any combinations that don't satisfy the equations of motion will not be massless fields. You won't satisfy the equations of motion anymore. So let me show you that in a bit more detail and go through this case that Lara started. So the first step that we're going to do whenever we're trying to find a set of moduli is write down the background equations and the solution to them. So write down the supersymmetric equations in this case. And here, I'm just going to ask you to believe me that I'm writing down the only relevant ones for what I'm going to say here. You have to write down all of the equations and perturb them. Um, the other equations in this example I'm going to give here wouldn't give us any further constraints. Um, and so I'm just going to write down the ones that are important. And the ones that are important for us here is that f a bar b bar equals zero. This is one of the equations that comes from analyzing the gauge no variation and asking for supersymmetry to be preserved. That, true, that equation is actually true in the Strominger system case as well, but it's certainly true for a club yeah. And the other thing that we have to have is that the manifold that we're compactifying on is complex. Club yeah manifolds are complex. So what we do is we assume that we have such a solution to the theory. We have a gauge field and a complex manifold such that this equation holds. You actually don't need for this to know what that solution is. You just have to assume you have such a solution. You might want to find one to prove that they exist, but nevertheless, you just need a solution. So that's the first step. You have a, a background. And then you just perturb all your fields in the problem. So let me say just a five second aside on why you must um, perturb all the fields, just by a simple example. 
because there's a lot of stuff in the literature where people don't perturb all the fields and they get crazy answers. Imagine a ball on a plane. So just an inclined plane and you roll a ball down the plane. What does the dynamics of that look like? Well, you know that, right? You have the ball at the top of the hill, you let go, it rolls down. Nothing particularly exciting. Now imagine I constrain the degrees of freedom on the plane. I'm going to put a train track in a U-shape on the train. Right? So I just have a train track that goes down and then up in a nice big U-shape on the inclined plane. If I now have a ball on the train track and I let it go, it rolls down and then back up again. Hey, look, I've just discovered an interesting phenomenon. Not of the original theory, right? You just constrained what you were looking at and you ended up with something different. So you're not allowed to constrain the field variations in any way that doesn't come from the equations of motion themselves or you'll change the dynamics. So you must perturb all of the fields that appear in your equations. Okay, okay so what fields do we have here? Well, clearly, um, first of all, these equations depend on the gauge field. It's got a gauge field strength in there. So let's write A0 as the background gauge field, whatever it is that satisfies this equation, plus some delta A. And we also need to write down a complex structure tensor because we've got a manifold that's complex. This is written in terms of complex coordinates. So if I change what I mean by complex coordinates, if I change the complex structure tensor, I'll change this equation. So I need to write down a complex structure tensor, a background one plus a perturbation. If you want to think about this in terms of what we had in the first lecture, um, this complex structure uh, tensor is just the straight J I had, the, the two form that came from the SU3 structure with one index raised by the metric. Okay. So these are the only fields that appear in these equations. Seeing as the other fields don't appear, they can't possibly be constrained. So you just plug into the equation for the next step and see what you get. So first of all, we write down our solution, then we perturb all the fields, then we plug into the equation. And what do we get in this case? Well, I believe Lara wrote this up for you last time and did a bit of the computation. It's not very hard to work through. And what you get is the following. In fact, this equation is very easy to understand. This is the perturbation to this equation. It's the perturbation to the 0, 2 field strength. So what are these two terms? Well, I changed two things. I changed the connection. So I started with a zero, a vanishing zero, two field strength, two barred indices. But then I changed the connection, and, and when I change the connection, I can pick up a piece of zero, two field strength, and that's what that term is. The other thing that I started with is I started with FAB bar equals zero, but for example, this didn't have to be zero. So I could have had a one, one part of the field strength. So I had a one, one part of the field strength, but then I changed the complex structure so I could rotate part of that one, one part of the field strength into the zero, two component, just by changing what I mean by complex indices. And that's what this term is. Here's the one, one field strength you started with. This is sort of the unperturbed version. And then I perturbed the complex structure and turned it into a, a zero, two part. So all this equation says is that those two contributions that you pick up on perturbation to the zero, two field strength have to cancel each other to keep F zero, two vanishing. Now you can stop there if you want to. So for example, if your question is, what complex structure variations are moduli in the low energy theory? What correspond to massless fields? The answer is, a fluctuation of the complex structure tensor is mass, corresponds to a massless field if and only if there exists some delta A that solves this equation for that fluctuation. Unfortunately, that's totally useless, right? as is often the case in life. Um, we don't know the metric on a Klar Biao. The equation for this field strength here is GAB bar FAB bar equals zero. So we don't even know the equation to solve for this field strength. So while this is formally very nice, it's totally useless. I can't use it for anything. So although in principle we could stop here if we were clever and could write down Klar Biao metrics, in fact we can carry on if we want to compute something. And the next step then is to interpret um, uh, this in terms of cohomology. So let's look at, first of all, at the allowed complex structure, the complex structure that are actually low energy fields. So first of all, delta J here is an element of H1 TX. Um, 
It's just a fancy way of saying uh, complex structure deformations have one barred and one unbarred index. They're closed, and you don't care about exact pieces because that's just a coordinate change. If you're not used to that, see uh, Green, Schwartz, and Witten, volume two, page 467. But it's just this fluctuation, to be a fluctuation of a complex structure on a complex manifold has to be an element of cohomology. So we start with a delta J here that's an element of cohomology, this delta J here. Now, what does this piece here do? Well, if you do a bit of algebra, you can figure out that this left-hand side is closed. <clears throat> okay. So, in fact, you could view this left-hand side as defining an element in cohomology. In fact, it maps delta J to another type of cohomology. So what, what kind of cohomology would this be an element in? Well, it has two-barred free index, so it's going to be some... It's going to map delta J to some H2. What is it H2 of? Well, this thing is, va is the field strength, so it's valued in the adjoint representation. So you just want a bundle that keeps track of the fact that this two-form has an adjoint gauge index. And the way you write that in, in bundle language is it's H2 of n naught v. It just means it's a two-form, the, the cohomology of two forms valued in the adjoint. So this left-hand side defines a map from H1TX to H2NV. You have to do a bit of work to prove it's actually a good map in cohomology, but if you use the equations of motion, it's very, very easy to do. So what are the allowed complex structure? Well, the allowed complex structure are those for which there is a solution to this equation. So the equations of motions are satisfied by the fluctuations. When can I solve this equation? Well, the right-hand side here is exact, so I can solve this equation if and only if the left-hand side is exact. If this is exact, it's zero in cohomology. So what I want is this map from delta J to this element of H to N TX to map something exact, to map to zero in cohomology. Exact forms are zero in cohomology. So the allowed complex structure are just the kernel of this map. And the map is defined by the supergravity data. It's just defined by F. So just by staring at this equation, you can see that that's the allowed complex structure. It went quite fast there. I was expecting at least one stop and do that again. But no? No? All right. Um, so the allowed complex structure are either those that satisfy this equation for some delta A, or, completely equivalently, the kernel of this map between cohomologies. Notice the kernel lives inside the complex structure space, inside the source space, so it's a subset of the complex structure of the base manifold, and it's a subset that's picked out by taking a kernel of a map with the map being defined by the supergravity data. Why is this better than this? Well, this I can calculate in algebraic geometry. And we have done in many examples in our papers. So now you can actually figure out what the moduli are, even though you don't know the metric. There's another piece, actually. So you could have a fluctuation that's both a fluctuation of delta J and delta A here, or you could have just a fluctuation of delta A that's closed. So the allowed bundle moduli, as Lara called them, would just be... Um, elements of H0 and V, uh, adjoint valued one forms that are closed, and you only care about them up to exact pieces because exact changes are just gauge transformations. So the moduli of a heterotic Calabi L compactification, the complex structure and bond bundle moduli, are not H1 TX and H0 and V, as you'll read in many textbooks. That's incorrect. It's actually the kernel of this map and H1 and V. Yes, sir? Um, I've used the equation of motion already extensively here. Um, I don't know of a way to make... Well, I'm going to show you one way to make this look simpler in a second. Um, but yeah, I don't know of a way to make this look simpler, but it's a good question. James, you can interpret it differently between the original H1TX and the kernel of the Very good, yeah. Um, I should be careful there. So, 
no mic on, so I'll just repeat to make sure everyone heard. So Timo is saying, can I view this, the difference between this and H1TX itself, as coming from a mass term in a superpotential? And the answer is morally yes, but actually no. So this is going to give a mass to the fluctuations that are projected out. What's that mass scale going to be? There's only one mass scale in the problem. It's the compactification scale. So in most compactifications, thinking of the other elements of H1TX as 4D fields is just simply wrong. However, you can build constructions, and we have a lot of these in our papers that we've talked about before, which is probably what you've... So we can build constructions where there's some clever extra number in there that's kind of small. So then the mass of stuff that's projected out by this kernel is actually below the compactification scale by some parametric factor. And then you can write it as a mass term in the superpotential. And we do a bunch of that in our papers to show it works out. So this is actually, in that sense, an F-term constraint. You can write it out. The reason I didn't present it that way here is generally you can't think of it in terms of a superpotential because the mass scale is so high it should never have been in the 4D theory. It's a great question. There's one more step you could do here. And one more step you could do is to make this look even nicer. Um, and this is to do with that bundle Lara presented last time. So our final step, so we did Susie equations. We perturbed the fields. We worked, wrote, plugged them into the equation, and we interpreted it in terms of cohomology. Now we can interpret in terms of a particular bundle. Let me show you what I mean. So I, I believe Lara wrote up the Atiyah short exact sequence. Not V goes to Q, goes to Tx, goes to 0. This, this sequence defines Q as a bundle. Q is almost this one plus this one, uh, but not quite. The sequence basically mixes those together in, two together in a non-trivial non way. And if you define the bundle Q like this, the claim is, is that these moduli that we're describing here or more accurately, the tangent to the moduli space, the quadratic fluctuations that are allowed, these moduli are described by H1 of Q. So how do you see this? Well, there's a little gadget that helps you see. Oh, I can probably fit it in this corner. There's a little gadget that, can I fit it in? No. There's a little gadget that helps you out here called a long exact sequence. So whenever you have a short exact sequence like this, so the image of this map is the kernel of this map, and so on and so forth, whenever you have a short exact sequence of either sheaves or bundles, these are bundles, then there's an associated long exact sequence in cohomology. So the long exact sequence in cohomology associated to that sequence looks like the following. So first of all, you can just take the same set of bundles and take H naught of them and write them in a row like that. So I probably moved it off the board, yeah, but the sequence we had before was NV goes to Q goes to TX, just written it in the same order but with H naughts. Basically, the maps you had in the previous sequence just go straight on to the, define these maps for you because you had maps between bundles and now you have maps between forms of defined on bundles, and that just induces a, a natural map. And then you can use some kind of derivative operator to go round to H1, and you can just keep going. OK. Now, we're on a club yao here. And a fun fact about a true club yao, not a torus or something, but a true club yao is that H0 Tx equals 0. So now this, this, this sequence becomes a bit simpler because I've got a zero here. So I can write this out in a bit more detail. I'm both not short enough and too short for this. OK, there we go. So <clears throat> if this is zero, I can just start here. So I have zero goes to h1 and v goes to h1 q goes to h1 tx, goes to h2 and v, and it keeps on going. And now we can learn something about h1 q. These are exact sequences. That means that the image of one map is the kernel of the next, and so on and so forth. The reason that's useful is this zero being here, this piece, 
then tells you that H1NV injects into H1Q. That's kind of what this piece of the sequence means. To see that, you have to stare at the maps and think about it a little bit. Likewise, this piece here tells me that there's a contribution to H1Q, which is the kernel of this map. So if you stare at the nature of these maps for a little bit, using this long exact sequence, you'll find that H1 of Q is just H1 of NV, because that was sort of plugged in whole here, plus the kernel of the map between H1 TX and H2 NV. So if you define our bundle Q in the way we did, this is, the mod this is what H1Q looks like. That's exactly what we had for the moduli. This is the bundle moduli, and this is the allowed complex structure. Okay, so the, yes, sir? Beautiful question. So, the, uh, fantastic question. So someone's saying, how do we know that this map is the cohomology class of F, which is what we had before? Um, you have to say what the map is in defining this bundle, Q, um, because that, uh, whatever you choose there, will induce that map. And when Atiyah defined that bundle, he chose the map that defines it to be the cohomology class of the field string. So he could have chosen something else and he would have got it wrong, but he's a seriously smart bunny, so he didn't do that. Um, so he chose the map in the original sequence so this would work out. Atia was interested in the question of, if I have a bun holomorphic bundle over a complex manifold, which deformations of the combination will preserve the complex nature of the whole thing? So he was basically solving the same problem, so it works out the same. He just didn't do it from this perspective. So the complex structure and the bundle moduli are not H1TX and H1NV, they're some subset, and the way you work out moduli is easy. You write down the classical solution, you perturb around it, uh, that gives you an equation for the allowed fluctuations that will correspond to massless moduli. You can't work out anything out with that, so then you try and turn it into cohomologies and bundles, so it's something you can compute with using algebraic geometry. So the next question is, can we do the same thing with the Strominger system? We don't actually know any solutions to the Strominger system, but I didn't use a specific Calabi out here anyway. So even if I don't know solutions to the Strominger system, I could work out that what their moduli would be if we had them, assuming they exist. Let's hope they exist. <coughs> so let's just go through the same set of steps. Actually, I'll probably keep a few bits here. <coughs> the same set of steps and see what happens in the Strominger system. So we're going to need the Susie equations. They'll be different. Uh, we're going to need to perturb all the fields, yeah. Uh, we're going to need to plug them into the equations. Uh, we have to interpret in terms of, that's supposed to be, I realize that's completely illegible. That's supposed to be co for cohomology. Um, apologies. And then we'll need to interpret in type of a bundle. So let's see if we can do the same thing for the Strominger system. OK. So what are the SUSY equations? And again, I'm going to focus on the relevant ones in sort of reference to Timo's question. These would be the ones that, if there was a 4D picture, would correspond to F terms, not D terms. This will work in any case where there's no U1 in the low energy gauge group. So <clears throat> the relevant equations that we're going to look at in this case the same one we had before, that's because the gay geno variation doesn't contain H or anything. So it's not going to change when you go to the Strominger system. We also have... So I'm rewriting uh, the Strominger system in a particular way here. So we had it in terms of constraints on torsion classes before. This is an equivalent formulation, and I'll give you a reference for it in a second. The reason I'm writing out this formulation is it's the one that, if you perturb it, gives, gets you closest to something that's going to look like a cohomology so that you can see what's going on. So these are the relevant equations. Um, and the ones we're ignoring, just for completeness, are these ones and this one. I'm, I'm going to ask you to believe me that I can ignore these for the purposes of this analysis. Nope. So, I'm sure that the Strominger system has been written in this way 
a billion times um, over the course of the subject. But just to give you the paper where I first saw it written in this particular way, just because it was a, a clear rewriting and I could understand it easily. You can find this rewriting there, but I'm sure it's, it's all over the place. They were doing something much more complicated than just rewriting the, the Strominger system. Okay. So those are our equations. We have to perturb all the fields, all of them. So we have this equation as we had before, so we are going to have to perturb A, and we are going to have to perturb the complex structure, J naught plus delta J. But we now have other fields in here too, this is actually that two-form, the symplectic two-form that appeared in this SU3 structure. So it's the J of the SU3 structure. So we need to perturb that. So I've got a curly J and a straight J. <coughs> Great notation. Um, we're also going to have to perturb H, the Neva Schwartz field strength here. So that's going to give us some H naught, which is the unperturbed thing plus some closed perturbation, d of which is zero, plus, because I'm perturbing basically the metric by perturbing these two and also perturbing the gauge field, there'll be a perturbation to the right-hand side here, and I have to take that into account when pertur perturbing. perturbing h. There'll be uh, the change in the yang mills chern simons term and the change in the Lorentz chern simons term. These are just terms that are functions of the fields that take into account that the perturbation in H and the perturbation in these quantities have to be linked. Now, what we'd like to do is just plug this into our equations for the next step and just complete, uh, uh, proceed in complete generality, but we can't figure out how to make that work. So what I'm going to have to do here is make an assumption Uh, w3, so this is Yang Mills. So what this means is this is the thing that if you take, if this wasn't perturbed, if you just take omega 3 Yang Mills, it's the thing which D of which gives you trace F wedge F. This is the thing D of which gives you trace L wedge R. And because we're perturbing everything, the perturbation of H has to be linked to the perturbation of these two quantities. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay, so how am I going <clears> to... <throat> What assumption am I going to make to simplify this system? It's quite a strong assumption of the Fu Yao class of solutions that were known, for example. Some of them satisfy this assumption, some of them don't. But nevertheless, I'm going to have to make an assumption associated to the D-bar lemma. So let me write up a lemma, and then I'll say how we're going to use it. So the lemma is the following. Let X be a compact... Taylor manifold uh, for capital A, uh, a straight D closed form, in particular, straight D closed PQ form, the following statements are equivalent. If A is D bar exact, that's the same as A being D exact, which is the same as A being straight D exact, which is the same as A being D D bar of something, which is the same as A being curly D of something plus straight uh, curly D bar of something else. Basically, what this says is on a compact Kähler manifold, if something's closed with respect to straight D, basically all forms of exactness are the same. If it's D bar of something, you can just replace that with D of something else. There's always some C prime and some C double prime and so on such that this is true. That's for a Kähler manifold, and we're interested in the Strominger system, which is not Kähler manifolds. The assumption we're going to make is that our non-Kähler manifolds obey this property. And some do and some don't. It's just a subclass of the possibilities. I'd like to tell you how restrictive a subclass is. I guess it's quite restrictive, but I don't know because we don't have any good examples. Okay, I'm going to make that technical assumption. Let's get back to our main story. We write down our SUSY equations. We perturb all our fields. You plug it into the equations. And what you get is a total and complete mess. 
which I'm not going to write up because it would take the rest of the lecture and it's just a waste of time. So you get a total mess, but that's okay because we didn't use the field equation last time anyway, right? We turned it into something in terms of cohomology. So what you have to do is take your total mess. If you really want to torture yourself with it, it's in the paper. I should probably tell you what the paper is. Uh, you can find all of this. Sorry. You can find all of the stuff I'm talking about. This is work with Lara and Eric Sharp. You can find it here. If you look at our paper, please do also look at this paper by Xenia de la Rosa and her collaborators. Uh, we found out we were working on the same thing, and we waited and published the same day. Um, they have a completely different approach to the same thing. You won't recognize it from this lecture, but it's an equivalent uh, formulation. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at our paper, you'll see this total mess. But all I'm going to say is we just stared at it and said, can we interpret that in terms of cohomology? Because that's the thing you calculate with anyway, because cohomology. So if you stare at it, you get something which you're probably going to think is a mess as well, but it turns out to have a nice structure. So if you stare at it, what do you get? What do the allowed fluctuations... Stop, stop. What does the allowed fluctuations of all these fields look like in this case? I'm going to write it up. It's going to look unintelligible, and then we'll talk about it. So we have, first of all, a kernel of a kernel of a map from h1tx to h2nv plus h2ndtx. And then this map here, so this is one kernel uh, living inside h1tx. And then this gets mapped to something else, and you take the kernel again. So you just have to stare at the equations and prove that this is the allowed fluctuation. So that's one piece. Then you have three more pieces. You have another curve, which is just the kernel of H1 and V, mapping to something else. You have a third piece, which is a kernel of H1 TX, mapping to something else. And you have a fourth piece, <coughs> which is just h1 tx dual. Okay, that looks like a mess. So let's actually say what's going on here and what these pieces are. <coughs> I'm going to concentrate on these three pieces first. This one, this one, and this one. I'll come back to this one in a second. Naively, if you looked at a Calabi L compactification, you would expect three types of moduli. You'd expect complex structure living in h1 tx. You'd expect bundle moduli living in H1NV, and you'd expect Kähler moduli living in H1TX dual. Turns out, for the Strominger system, if it obeys the DD bar lemma, what Yao would call cohomological Kähler, for example, that the answer is the same, surprisingly, except you only get subsets of those moduli. Basically, you're adding stuff, and it's stabilizing moduli. So you have all of these maps, and then you take all of these kernels. All of these maps are defined by different pieces of the supergravity data, the curvature of the space-time, the flux that you're adding on the manifold, the gauge bundle, field strength, as we saw in the Atiyah class, and they just restrict the moduli. So you get some subset of the complex structure, you get some subset of the bundle moduli, and you get all of the Kähler moduli. Now, you may be thinking, oh, that's a bit strange. I expect, if you're an expert on these things, I expected the overall volume of the manifold to be fixed, for example, is something that you often get as a question. The overall volume of the manifold does not live, because the Kähler form, the symplectic form is not closed for an SU3 structure manifold, does not live in here. So this, this set of moduli does not include the overall volume of the manifold. So you'd get some set of moduli, which looks a lot like what you would get in a, a naive calabi case. It's just that they get restricted by the supergravity data in, in terms of these maps. What's this last piece? This is a technical irritation. This whole thing only works if you vary the spin connection and pretend it's different, it's independent of the metric. So you have to do all of this, get the moduli, and then remember, oh, yeah, the spin connection is connected to the metric. Both uh, Xenia's group and our group found the same thing. I don't know why that is, but that's the only way this works. Okay, that looks quite messy as I've written it. If you've spent enough time staring at it, it becomes your baby, and you think it looks pretty. But I understand that other people don't like it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's nice in that even for a non kähler manifold, I'm describing the moduli in terms of Dobel cohomology, which is something of a surprise. But <clears throat> you can interpret much nicer by doing that last step where we interpret in terms of a bundle. 
So what you can do is you can try and write down, just stare at this and write down the bundle that it corresponds to. David. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know of any such nice description. That's a very good question. Um, the Fu Yao, um, oh, let's say the goldstein Pakushkin spaces, satisfy the Strominger conditions, and some of them are DD bar. So I know that there is a subset of the Strominger system torsion classes constraints that are of this form. I don't know that I can write it in this, in, just in a simple way in terms of torsion classes. I would suspect not, but I might be wrong. It's a fantastic question. Now, it's a really great question. I should look into that. Okay, so what you do is you take your cohomology stuff and you just stare at it and say, can I see a bundle? That may look quite hard, but it's actually quite easy because you know that the gauge field equations didn't change, so the Atiyah sequence or something like it better be in there somewhere that you already know, and then you're just looking for a modification of that. And if you just stare long enough, you'll find you can define the following bundle. So if I define Q almost as before, so I have end naught V plus end naught TX goes to Q, goes to TX, goes to zero. So if I define a bundle Q like that, and then define a bundle H in terms of that one, then what you'll find <clears throat> is if you do this long exact sequence thing associated to now these two short exact sequences, you'll find the moduli are exactly H1 of this bundle H, defined in this way. What does this mean? This means that uh, the entirety of the low energy effective theory of heterotic compactifications could be defined not in terms of bundle moduli and Kähler moduli and complex structure, but in fact could and probably should be defined in terms of the set of degrees of freedom H1H. And that's redefining the effective theory in that way is something that my collaborators and I are working on. One thing I should add about this sequence here, which is rather important in this context, is we got this, this bundle in exactly the way I've described here. This is exactly how we went through and found it. But something that's almost but not quite this had actually already appeared in the literature, and we just didn't know about it. It appeared in the heterotic literature in the context of T-duality. People were looking at heterotic T-duality. They didn't quite get this, but it was very close. So Baragula... Baba, sorry. Baragi... Oh, goodness. Baraglia and Hekmati have a very nice paper in the context of heterotic T-duality where they get almost this sequence. Um, it just doesn't have that piece. They're looking at background solutions. They're not interested in moduli. They're looking at background solutions. And they still found very close to the same structure. And we found that encouraging because that means that if this structure starts appearing all over the place in, in a heterotic theory, then presumably there's something a bit deeper than just, hey, you can describe the moduli that way. OK, so that was going to be my example of what's being done in general analysis. I have no idea how to build myself a nice class of Strominger solutions, but if ever anyone manages to do it, please let me know. If anyone ever manages to do it, then we can at least in a subclass work out what the moduli are. If you wanted to work out the interactions, you can do the same thing. You can just perturb further, go to third order and get, or second order in the equations and get the interactions as well, and you can keep going. And doing that is actually something I'm doing with uh, Lara Anderson and Magdalene Lafors and, and Andre Lucas in what is becoming fast an ancestral project spanning many decades. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to stop there with the general analysis, unless there's any questions, and give you an example of a type of project that people have been doing recently building new examples of, of compactification manifolds. So have a think of any questions while I'm erasing a board, and then we'll move on to a new example. Oh, I'm going to have to do the squeegee thing, aren't I? Okay. <clears throat> So if I'm going to give you an example of an example, if I'm going to give you an example of building a manifold that's interesting for string compactification, it's almost certain I'm going to be talking about Club Yao because I don't know how to do anything else. So what I'm going to talk about is a new set of Club Yao manifolds that were generated in a slightly different way to those that currently, well, those that appeared in the literature before. And it's going to be a generalization of a set of Club Yao manifolds 
I'm so out of shape that erasing the board makes me tired. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a set of manifolds that are a generalization of a set that Lara told you about last time. Did I put it up? Yeah, I did put it up. So I taught in Germany for three years where they do this. You can imagine what my classes were like. <clears throat> okay. Good enough. All right. So what data set are we going to generalize, just to remind you, and what's the generalization going to look like? So we're going to look at the generalization of the CCs. Uh. And this is work with uh, Lara Anderson, Fabia Prutzi, who's in Penn and about to move to Oxford, Sung Zhu, was a key player, who's here, um, and Xin Gao, who's uh, currently in Rome. And <clears throat> this can be found in 1507-03235. And there's a couple of follow-up papers around. Uh, for example, there's some nice work that's not quite the same construction, actually, but a related a couple set of ideas by Tristan Hubsch and Per Berglund. And a few mathematics groups have, have taken up looking at some of this as well. Okay, so what's the idea? What data set are we going to generalize and how are we going to generalize it? So we've seen CCs in this. I don't think they were called CCs, but you've seen a certain set of manifolds in this set of lectures that look like this. So I write down a configuration matrix. Okay. This is a famous manifold, actually. It's called the Schoen or the split by cubic. Um, and this matrix defines for us a Klar BR manifold. So let me just quickly remind you how that is. The Klar BR manifold, the complex involved space, is going to be described by embedding it in something simple. So, so this is an ambient space that it's going to live in that is P1 times P2 times P2. So we're going to put our complicated manifold inside that simple space. The fact that it lives inside something simple is what's going to give us calculational control. And then the remaining two columns in this matrix are going to give us the degrees of polynomials that are the defining relations of the club, yeah. So let me just quickly remind you how that looks. So if I write the homogeneous coordinates of these projective space factors as x, y, and z, then um, the first column corresponds to a defining equation P1, which would look something like some set of coefficients a linear in x and then a cubic in z. A linear in x and a cubic in z. And it would be linear in x and cubic in y for p2. Oop, let's give it a different name. No, y. So if you choose these, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you choose these coefficients generically enough, uh, this will be a Klar-BR manifold. In fact, these, the space of possible coefficients here is some redundant description of part, in general, of the complex structure moduli space of the Klar-BR. And the way this looks is you just have the ambient space, this P1 times P2 times P2, and then you have some locus P1 equals 0. You have some other locus P2 equals 0. And the Klar BL is just the intersection of the two. You start with two, three, four, five dimensions. You put two constraints on, you end up with a three-dimensional manifold. And if you work it out right, it's, it's going to be Klar BL. So this is what we're going to generalize. How are we going to generalize this in 15 minutes? That's a good question, but we're going to try. How are we going to generalize this? We're going to generalize this by doing something that looks completely insane. We're going to put minus signs in. So I'll say, do, give you an example of how we're going to generalize it, and then we'll say why it looks insane. We're going to look, write down something that looks like this. Here's an example of a GCC, a generalized CC. So anyone who knows algebraic in geometry in the audience should be cringing. Um, so the whole point of algebraic geometry is you explain things in terms of polynomials. This is supposed to be the degrees of polynomials, and I just wrote down minus signs, so naively this is a set of rational functions which has very little to do with algebraic geometry. So what my job is going to be is, this is the type of generalization we've written down for what these Klar-BR manifolds can be. I have to explain to you what I mean by that. What, how is this, we know how this configuration matrix is going to define a Klar-BR manifold. How will this one? To do that, 
I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'm going to interpret this configuration matrix in a different, more complicated way, which will nevertheless be absolutely equivalent to what I've written here. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to change how I think about the configuration matrix in a way that for the ordinary CCs will be equivalent. But the reason I'm going to do that is that then that way of looking at the configuration matrices will allow me to apply it to this. OK, so how do we interpret this thing in a different way? So in the previous case, so this case, I can interpret, interpret uh, P1 not as some polynomial directly, like I did here, but I can interpret, interpret it as a section, a global section, an element of H0 of a line bundle over a club, yeah. And the line bundle is just given by this set of integers. So this set of integers, I think Lara probably told you about this, this set of integers just tells me the first churn class of the line bundle, which uniquely defines it here for me. Um, and what I'm going to do is instead of saying P1 is a polynomial of this degree, I'm going to say it's a section of this line bundle. Now, I haven't done anything there because we, Pn, products of Pn's are so simple that we know all line bundle cohomology over them. You can look them up in your favorite algebraic geometry textbook. And if you ask your favorite algebraic geometry textbook, what are the global sections of this line bundle, where they're those polynomials? So I haven't actually done anything. I just gave it a fancy notation. Similarly for P2, it'll just be the other one. <clears throat> okay. So then, in terms of writing things in this way, What's the problem with these minus signs? Why is this a crazy thing to do? The problem So the problem here is that um, if you work out the dimension, which you often write as little h, so the dimension of the cohomology class you would use, say, for this defining relation, so if you work out the dimension in the ambient space of this set of sections, so if I compare this to what I had there, this one should be h naught on the ambient space of this line bundle. You look it up in your textbook on algebraic geometry, and that's zero. There aren't any sections of that type. <clears throat> so there's no defining relation available, which is what you'd expect, because there's a minus sign there. There's no polynomial. So how are we going to fix this? How are we going to make sure that we get ourselves a nice defining relation? Well, what we're going to do is, instead of saying we're going to have all of these equations as being equations in an ambient space, we're going to apply them one at a time. We'll start from the left and we'll work to the right as a convention. So first of all, we're going to apply this. So this is the solution to this problem. We're first going to apply this first equation and get some manifold. And then in that new manifold, we'll try and think about this equation. We're going to do them one at a time, working left to right. So we're going to define it's a manifold, so let's be inventive and call it M. We're going to define M to be P1, P1, P5, 1, 1, 1. There's no problem defining that in the usual way because uh, there's no minus sign, so it's just some polynomial. And now what I'm going to ask is that P2, the defining relation that corresponds to this column, I'm going to ask it to be an element of H0 of M of O1 minus 1, 1. In other words, I'm going to ask not that this bundle has sections on the ambient space, I'm going to ask that this bundle has sections once I've applied the first hypersurface. And that's a different question. That may act, a P2 of that form may actually exist. I've got 10 minutes, so I think I can show you that it does. So there's a very useful piece of kit. If you have something, complex, something complicated inside something simple, and you want to relate cohomology on the complicated thing to cohomology on the simple thing, 
There's a sequence that allows you to do that, which is immensely useful. And it's called the causal sequence. And I'm just going to do this for hypersurfaces here, because it's going to be simpler for me to write out. But there's a direct analog that you can find in any math book or in our papers for higher co-dimension. And let me just draw up what the causal sequence is, and then we'll talk about it a little bit so you can get a rough idea of, of how it works. The coastal sequence for a hypersurface looks like the following, and I'm going to have to tell you what each of these pieces are. So I'm going to start by explaining these two pieces, and then we'll think about what this piece is. So these two, both of these, are bundles on the ambient space. <clears throat> so these are bundles on P1 times P1 times P5 in this case. Uh, and I just have to say what bundles they are. So L is going to be actually any bundle of interest to me, but we're going to do line bundles. So it's any line bundle that's going to be of interest to me. Here it will be the line bundle 1 minus 1, 1. And N dual is the normal bundle to the surface we're talking about. So it's just a fancy way of saying if we're looking at the surface 1, 1, 1, N is just O, 1, 1, 1. It's defined such that the map between these two, so this is the thing you want, you just plug in what you want, and you choose something here so that the map is the defining relation of your surface. So if NM is that, this dual, this V on it, just means you take the dual bundle, which is the same as just putting in minus signs. But it's just defined so that the map is P1. Why would you do that? If you have a short exact sequence like this, the maps are mapping fiber to fiber at each point on the base for the bundles. So if I think about my ambient space and my surface P1 equals 0, I can figure out what's going to happen in this map. This short exact sequence is just a fancy way of saying that this bundle is the co-kernel of this map. It's just a fancy math way of saying that. Now, if I'm not on the locus, P1 equals 0, if I'm over here somewhere, P1 is just some non-zero number, by definition. If, you, if P1 is 0, you're on the locus P1 equals 0. So if P1 is not equal to 0, then it's just some number. And if this map is a non-zero number at some point over the base, it's just mapping the one-dimensional um, uh, fiber here into the one-dimensional fiber here in an on-to way, right? one-to-one -one and on-to. Just multiplying some number in the one-dimensional fiber by a number. It's, you can go either way. It's one-to-one. -one. So the co-kernel in such a map is zero. This map is subjective. I can get any number on a fiber here by multiplying some number here by a non-zero number. I get no fiber at all in the co-kernel at any of these points. So this thing is not a bundle. It's a sheaf. And the reason it's a sheaf is that some places it doesn't have a fiber. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, on the locus where P1 is 0, there's nothing in the image of this map. If the map is 0, there's nothing in its image. So the co-kernel on the places where P1 is 0 is going to be all of the fiber of L. So when you're on this locus here, you just have the fibers of your original bundle over the locus P1 equals 0. In other words, what this is is the restriction of this bundle to your surface. That's how this is set up. OK, if you didn't follow that, what's the point of this sequence? The point of this sequence is here I have some bundles on the ambient space whose cohomology I know how to calculate, and here I have a bundle on the clubial, or not clubial, bundle on this surface whose cohomology I want to calculate, and they're related. So I can relate something I don't know to something I do, and I can try and do a computation. How am I going to relate a sequence of bundles like this, or a sequence of sheaves, to cohomology? Well, we've already seen that. Associated to any short exact sequence in sheaves, there's a long exact sequence in cohomology. So if I write that out in this case, I think I've got time. <clears throat> it 
If I write that out in this case, if you plug all the bundles together that I've told you about, I want to do L is this guy, and the normal bundle is this guy, and if I plug them all together, I'm gonna get that I've got this short exact sequence, and this is the same line bundle restricted to M, it's restricted to the locus P1 equals zero, then the long exact sequence in cohomology associated to that will look like, just following the same rules as before, sections of the first one on the ambient space. This A is the product of, of projective spaces. I just can't be bothered to write it out each time. O, 0, minus 2, 0. Goes to H, naught. O, 1, minus 1, 1. Goes to H, naught. On M now, of O, M. 1, minus 1, 1. Keeps going. And the nice thing about this is this sequence is relating cohomologies you know, these ambient cohomologies that you can look up in a textbook because they're on products of projective spaces, to the type of thing that we wanted to know here to see if we've got a defining relation. So the relevant things to look up is if you look up, let me get this right, <coughs> excuse me, if you look up, yeah, both this and This cohomology on the ambient space, if you look up these two, they're zero. That means if I've got a zero there and a zero there, I'm going to just have zero goes to H naught of M. The thing I want goes to this. Just plugging in the zeros goes to zero. Um, and this is an exact sequence, so that just says that these two are the same. That one I know how to work out. It's in the textbook, and that's the one I want. If you work it out, this is one-dimensional. There exact, exists exactly one defining relation of the type we want. Now, I don't have time to tell you about it, because then we won't get coffee, but we actually have a way of finding explicitly what that defining relation looks like. So it does indeed look like a rational function in terms of the ambient coordinates of P1, P1, P5, but it's a very particular, unique, because this cohomology is one-dimensional, unique rational function that gives a good defining relation. Um, so you can then do a whole bunch of, of calculations, and what you can show in the end is that this is indeed a club Yau. You have to show a few more things. For a normal CC, for the thing without minus signs, if you, you take a generic enough polynomial, they're automatically smooth, and they're automatically connected. The same is, well, actually, the second one's not true. CCs are automatically connected if you use the standard list that people generated, but that's just an artifact of the way the list was made. But you have to check for these guys, are they smooth? And are they connected? And this one is. For example, if you, if smoothness you just check by brute force, by computing the singular locus and showing it's vanishing. Uh, connectedness, you can just compute h naught of the trivial bundle. And if it's one, it's connected. Um, and then you can do all the usual things, like work out Hodge numbers. So this has Hodge numbers h11, for example, of 3. And it has h21 of 81, and so on and so forth. And anything you can calculate in an ordinary CC you can also calculate for one of these. You lose no calculation of control. You just get a bigger set of manifolds. You could ask, do we get new manifolds in this way? It's actually not clear if this is a new manifold or not, the one I've given you here. I just use this as a simple example. It's also the same one at the start of the paper, so if you want to have a read, you won't be lost. Um, this certainly isn't in the CC list. It's certainly different from those. It may be the same as a toric hypersurface. We haven't bothered to work out. It's got the same Hodge data. We haven't bothered to work out the walls data that Lara told you about because we have plenty of other examples that are definitely new manifolds. So you can definitely create new Calabiao in this way. You could also, if you wanted to, generalize this technique to toric spaces, and some people have been thinking about that, and so on and so forth. But let me just finish uh, a minute or two, if I, if I can, um, by saying, A, what, why you would do this, and B, uh, sort of a very brief recap of, of the lectures. 
So why you would do this, um, apart from getting new Calabi L manifolds, which is always nice, um, is that many of the Calabi L, almost all of the Calabi L that we use in physics, almost all of them are constructed in a very, very, very similar way. They almost all take some simple space that I happen to know, put the Calabi out inside it so I get computational control from the simple thing that it's in and work stuff out. Toric hypersurfaces are like that. The CCs are like that. Many of them are like that. That's a problem because we often try and draw general conclusions from looking at our examples. Lara, I think, probably told you about the ubiquity of vibration structures in Calabi L. Basically, all Calabi L, bar a tiny handful that we know, are, are fibered in various ways. That statement comes from these constructions, which are all basically the same. So if you have a construction that's even a little bit different like this, you can check, do those general statements still hold? And that's something worth checking. Incidentally, here, if you, if you write, these things aren't classified. We don't even have a proof that this data set of Calabi L's is finite, although it will be. But if you just pick a random one of this, you'll find it is fibered in multiple different ways. So it seems that our general ideas from other examples are holding up. The other reason you may want to know about these is that they appear as duals in various duality chains to manifolds that were already known. So if you really want to understand certain string dualities, in particular something called target space duality, um, if you know about CCs, you have to know about these or the duality won't work. So there's all sorts of reasons why you'd want to know about them. Okay, so just a brief recap of what we've done. Um, we started with a description of the equations of motion of heterotic systems and the type of thing that we would be interested in, the type of manifolds and bundles that we need for solutions of those equations of motion to compactify down to an n equals 1, 4D theory, not necessarily vacuum. We then specialized absolutely massively. We looked at a very, very tiny subset, presumably, of those solutions, the calabi L manifolds, because those were the only cases where we actually knew how to do anything, because they're the only ones described by algebraic geometry. Once we specialized those, Lara spent two lectures talking about a whole bunch of features of the manifolds, what are known about Calabi Owls, their structure, what their moduli look like, and so on and so forth. And you can see that we know an awful lot about Calabi Owls, have been studied for many years. And then in the final lecture here, we've just looked at what you can do generally, even though you don't know many solutions to the Strominger system, you can still say things generally about what those, the effective theories that would arise from those solutions. And we talked just briefly about a new construction of Calabi Owls. So that's the kind of thing we've done. I should say, if you have any questions, do ask them while we're still here and ask them today. But if you have any questions that come up later, do send me or Lara an email. We're always happy to answer. A lot of people have already been emailing us with questions, and uh, please do continue to do so. So thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot uh, thank for a nice overview of what has happened, but also a nice uh, introduction of new subjects. So the any more questions? Just a quick question. Uh, in the first lecture, you mentioned a construction of Calabi-Aus, which is labeled by two integers. They, yeah, um, so that's a, uh, an SU3 structure manifold, yeah. So mathematician version of a calabi -Aus, yeah. So there are infinitely many of them? Yeah, so those, that's a great question. So those were an example of um, a Strominger system solution. So they're something that are non kähler but have vanishing first churn class. And you may say, well, do you have an infinite number of string vacua there if you have an infinite set of Hodge numbers? And in fact, Chiang Fei's stuff, which was the K3 or torus fibered over a genus G Riemann surface, also had an infinite set of topologies there. That's different to the Calabi L case, where we definitely only have a finite right, set. But is there a bound on the Hodge numbers, say? So this is there is no the bound question. on the Hodge numbers. They have an infinite set of Hodge numbers. But, so that's already different to the Calabi L case, because even in classical geometry, that wouldn't be true for Calabi L, as far as we know. But none of those solutions are a good string solution, because they all have small cycles, and they all have high curvature, and they were derived using supergravity equations in motion. So I don't, so it's a fantastic question. Mathematically, it's really interesting, because you've only, in some sense, it's generalized calabi a little bit, and mathematicians often would still call it calabi and suddenly you've got an infinite set of Hodge numbers. But from a physics perspective, does that mean we have an infinite set of string vacuum? I don't think so, because we haven't solved the right equations there, and it may be that a higher order they get. So there's no virtue to, uh, construction of them, at least for examples? That is a, a fantastic question. Um, there was some attempts to do uh, gauge linear sigma model type constructions of them by Alan Adams and his collaborators, and I believe the Munich, David might be able to tell me this, I believe the Munich group was working on something similar. I don't know how far they got, but I don't think they were able to prove that they were all good string vacuum or anything like that. But again, a fantastic question.
Yeah. Uh, yesterday, we were discussing that there is good reasons to believe that there is only a finite number of color BL3 faults, uh, and now you've got this new construction. Um, did you classify all the possible configuration matrices in this new construction? That is a fantastic question. Um, sadly, no. So I don't have a proof that this data set is finite, and without the proof that it's finite and without a reasonable bound, I can't run the computer. So no, I don't know how to prove that this is finite yet. Um, we haven't really tried very hard. Um, yeah, just hasn't been done yet. Good question. The reason it's a little bit hard is when you classify the ordinary CCs, you just have to do the matrices. Because if you find a matrix, you know that there's some choice of polynomial where it will be smooth, so you're good. Here, if you're classifying them, you have to generate every single matrix, and every time you made a matrix in your data set, you'd then have to check it's smooth and connected. That's a slower process on the computer. Instead of doing integer manipulations, you've had to go to polynomial manipulations, and that makes it slower. I certainly don't think it's necessarily impossible, and it would be an interesting project, but we just haven't tried, and we're actually not trying at the moment. So if you feel like giving it a go, go ahead. If there are no further questions, then let's thank James again. Thanks, folks.